Hi, my name is Esther Deblinger, and I'm a professor of psychology and psychiatry and the co-director of the CARES Institute at the School of Osteopathic Medicine at Rowan University. CARES stands for Child Abuse Research Education and Service. I was honored to be invited by the Association of Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies to share a little bit about those individuals who influenced my career, as well as my career choices, my professional development, and my clinical research contributions. In terms of important influences on my career, my parents and my family have had the most profound impact on my professional choices and my development. My parents probably had the greatest influence on my career focus. Unfortunately, both my parents grew up in poverty, and each parent had a parent who suffered from chronic illness, one a medical illness and the other a mental health illness. And both of those parents, my grandparents, passed away when my parents were very young teenagers. And it turns out that each of my parents experienced many other traumas in childhood that I didn't learn about until I was an adult. So in retrospect, indirectly, I learned a great deal from my parents about overcoming childhood trauma and about resilience, areas of research interest and focus for me over my entire career. My interest and research on the impact of trauma on children helped me a great deal to better understand my parents and admire their strengths in overcoming the emotional struggles that I witnessed but didn't fully understand as a child. And perhaps most importantly, because they had such a personal appreciation for the disadvantage, they certainly instilled in me the value and importance of helping others. During my college years at SUNY Binghamton, I was clear that I wanted to pursue a helping profession and I narrowed my choices to a career in psychology or law serving disadvantaged individuals. As a college student during the summers, I did some volunteer work in each of those fields, and that helped me to decide which direction to pursue. First, I worked on an inpatient child psychiatry unit, and I found myself particularly drawn to a child who the staff found very difficult. No matter what you said to her, she would often reply, I couldn't care less, that's my attitude. The staff tended to overreact to that statement with a lot of negative attention, which later in my psychology studies I learned provided lots of intermittent reinforcement, which kept that behavior going. At the time, I didn't know how to respond and just instinctively said to her one day, gee, I wish I had that attitude sometimes. And I think that shocked her, but I also engaged her. And before I knew it, we were doing what turned out to be a simple functional analysis about when that attitude of, I couldn't care less, that's my attitude, when it could be helpful and when it could be a hurtful attitude. Without realizing it, I was doing a little CBT. And the staff was pretty amazed at how friendly this little girl was to me and how cooperative she was with me generally. She used that phrase much less frequently and more appropriately with me. I still do think of that little girl and her favorite fra phrase, and I say it to myself occasionally when it is helpful. Another summer, I worked at a legal aid agency in New York City where I met some really extraordinary attorneys who were providing free of charge legal services to families in need. I thought I was doing a really good job there, but the supervisor apparently wasn't so satisfied, and one day, when she noticed the line of clients waiting for my assistance was much longer than usual, she asked me why I thought my line took so much longer than the other interns' lines. I explained that one of the women filing papers that day for a divorce mentioned that it was her fifth divorce. And I couldn't help but ask her why she thought each of those marriages failed. And she went on a little longer than I anticipated, but it was very interesting and I noticed some patterns of the choices she made and, and maybe she didn't recognize. The supervisor said, you know, Esther, you sound like you're providing more therapy than legal aid here. And I think that solidified my decision to pursue clinical psychology as opposed to law. And fortunately for me, I was accepted to SUNY Stony Brook for graduate school training. 
When I decided to apply for clinical psychology graduate programs, I didn't actually pay much attention to the theoretical orientations of the programs to which I was applying. I just wanted to get in somewhere, and I knew it was quite competitive. So I was pretty surprised and actually very lucky to be accepted to the SUNY Stony Brook PhD program. The faculty at Stony Brook were generally research focused and cognitive behavioral in their theoretical orientation. And it turns out that suited me perfectly well. I grew up in a family that was very dedicated to reviewing consumer reports before making any purchases. So the idea that Stony Brook would train me in a therapy approach or therapy approaches that were well researched made perfect sense to me. At Stony Brook, many of the faculty were giants in the field of cognitive behavioral therapy, including Drs. Daniel and Susan O'Leary, Dr. Wendy Silverman, Dr. Art Stone, and the late Dr. Ted Carr. I got a great education there, surrounded by fellow students, including Mark Durand and Corey Newman and others, many of whom have contributed greatly to the advancement of CBT approaches. And more recently, I've had the great good fortune of working on dissemination research with Drs. Chuck Webb and Adele Hayes, also Stony Brook grads and CBTers. The next most dramatic impact on my chosen area of research um, came when I met Dr. Susan McClear, a child psychiatrist. I couldn't be more grateful to her because she clearly had more confidence in giving me a job to serve as the co-director of the newly opening Child Sexual Abuse Diagnostic and Treatment Center than I had in myself at that time. Together at the Medical College of Pennsylvania, Dr. McClear and I opened a clinic, and fortunately for us, Dr. Edna Foa was a member of the faculty at that time, and she helped to mentor and supervise my work as we began to offer services for children and families in the aftermath of child sexual abuse. At that time, in 1987 or so, 86 or 87, there were many, many studies in the literature documenting the very negative impact of child sexual abuse. But there was no established treatment that was documented to be effective in terms of addressing the many difficulties children who've been sexually abused suffer. Given that this was my first professional position, that was scary. The assessment research was clear but there was no really good treatment research available at the time. The children we were beginning to see were at high risk for many problems, including depression, substance abuse, suicide attempts, and other interpersonal and emotional difficulties. We began to put together a treatment model that not only targeted the disorder of post-traumatic stress that we found to be most prevalent among these children, but it also addressed other related um, emotional and behavioral difficulties in children who had been sexually abused. This treatment model was also designed to include the non-offending caregivers of children impacted by sexual abuse. This was very important because many were extremely distressed and needed help not only coping with the news that their child was sexually abused, but also in learning how to respond to their child's emotional and behavioral difficulties. Working in the field of child abuse can be very challenging, and it is important to collaborate with law enforcement and child protection. So a few years later, when Dr. Martin Finkel, a child abuse pediatrician, recruited me to work with him to develop a medical and a mental health clinic for children impacted by abuse, I couldn't resist collaborating with him. He suggested that we would create a multidisciplinary team of not only mental health and medical professionals, but child protection and law enforcement professionals as well. Though Dr. Finkel at the time had no funds to support treatment outcome research, I was so committed to the idea of working collaboratively with multidisciplinary professionals, and I was naive enough to take the job thinking that I could write grants to obtain research funding. So as soon as I joined Dr. Finkel at the School of Osteopathic Medicine right here in New Jersey, I began to focus on writing those grant proposals. And Dr. Finkel's support of that mission has meant a great deal to me, so much so that I've spent the last 
28 years right here working side by side with an incredible team at the CARES Institute. We grew from a very small group of five professionals to over 60 multidisciplinary professionals. Shortly after joining the fantastic team at the CARES Institute, I received funding from the National Center for Child Abuse and Neglect to conduct my first randomized clinical trial examining the components of a treatment model for children with a history of sexual abuse. And it was at a meeting funded by that organization that I had the great good fortune to meet my colleague, Dr. Judith Cohen, a child psychiatrist, and Dr. Anthony Manorino, a psychologist. Interestingly, we discovered that we were all three working on developing very similar treatment models for the same population of children. And rather than competing with one another for the very limited federal research dollars available for treatment outcome research, we decided to collaborate. And we embarked on our first multi-site randomized trial funded by the National Institute of Mental Health to evaluate the efficacy of the intervention model we refer to today as trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, or TFCBT. We compared that model to the most commonly used treatment for child sexual abuse at that time, which was a child-centered supportive counseling model. Our results were quite striking, with TFCBT not only leading to greater reductions in depression and behavior problems, but that study also documented that almost 80% of children in the TFCBT condition overcame PTSD as compared to only 54% in the supportive counseling condition. Though those findings were quite dramatic, they needed to be replicated. And in fact, they have been replicated by additional studies we conducted at our own sites, as well as, and more importantly, by numerous other researchers who were interested in applying TFCBT to populations across the United States and around the world. In fact, to date, there are over 20 randomized trials of TFCBT that have more or less replicated those original findings. And these studies have been with children who've experienced a wide array of childhood traumas, including sexual abuse, exposure to domestic violence, exposure to community violence, children impacted by natural and man-made disasters, traumatic loss, severe bullying, and other types of traumas. I am particularly proud of our efforts to widely disseminate uh, training in trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy. Probably the most important step we took in that regard was a collaboration with Dr. Daniel Smith and Dr. Ben Saunders at the Medical University of South Carolina. In fact, the web-based training in TFCBT that was developed by MUSC has reached over 300,000 therapists worldwide. In addition, I've had the good fortune to collaborate with Dr. Shannon Dorsey from the University of Washington, another ABCT member. And she's done some amazing research examining how to best optimize the implementation of TFCBT with children in foster care. In fact, we learned that when working with children, therapeutic engagement with foster parents is critical. Finally, another important collaboration that has pushed me beyond my comfort zone, really, was my work with Dr. Melissa Runyon on the development of a treatment model for families at risk for child physical abuse. I must admit, when Dr. Runyon suggested that we work with parents who were physically abusive to their children, I was hesitant. I had been accustomed to working with non-offending caregivers, not the parents who directly caused harm to their children. But Dr. Runyon was very smart to encourage me to lead the first combined parent-child cognitive behavioral group program that we ran for this population of families. And to my surprise, I really connected with these parents. It was obvious to me that they loved their children, but they were less equipped to manage the challenges of parenting for many different reasons. This model has also been tested via both group format in a randomized trial at the CARES Institute, as well as in an individual format through a randomized trial that has recently been completed in Sweden. So in sum, I would say my most important contribution to research and the practice of clinical psychology 
has been the treatment outcome research we conducted with underserved populations. I've learned so much from this work about resilience. Recently, in fact, we published a study documenting that trauma-focused CBT not only effectively reduces trauma symptoms, but it also enhances resiliency among children impacted by trauma. This is something that we observed clinically very frequently among the children we worked with, so we were very happy to document that objectively. When I think back on my career, I realized that one could easily burn out over 30 years doing this kind of work. But I am someone who is a big believer in using cognitive behavioral coping skills personally, and I encourage other clinicians to do that as well. As I mentioned earlier, my career development and successes have been greatly influenced by my family, including my very supportive husband and our two fabulous children. And I'm very happy to acknowledge that during our almost 27 years of marriage and our many years of raising our children together, I personally learned how valuable cognitive behavioral coping skills were in terms of managing the challenges and complexities and joys of marriage, parenting, and life in general. In fact, the personal use of CBT skills by professionals in coping with day-to-day -day stress has become an important area of research for me today at the CARES Institute. We actually call this line of research in which we are examining the moderating effects of cognitive behavioral coping skills on therapists' job stress. We call this focus, practice what you preach. Being a mental health professional is incredibly fulfilling, but it can also be quite challenging and it can be quite stressful at times. And thus, my collaborators, Dr. Elizabeth Palio and Ms. Beth Cooper, and the entire team at the CARES Institute are dedicated to not only disseminating the evidence-based models that we've developed, but we are very interested in learning more about how to do that optimally while supporting the dedicated professionals who choose to serve children impacted by abuse and trauma. People suffer mental health illnesses the same way they suffer medical illnesses. And just as science has been so instrumental in advancing the treatment of many medical problems, with sufficient funding and commitment, we can make equally dramatic advances in the treatment of mental health disorders. This means we have to continue to push for real mental health parity in terms of funding, treatment, and dedication to the continued development of evidence-based treatments. We need to tackle the stigma associated with simply acknowledging mental health problems, and we need to demand equal attention in terms of adequate funding for research and effective treatment. I know that ABCT will continue to lead the field in advancing research that will enhance the efficacy and the dissemination of evidence-based practices. This will help to ensure that we are not a stagnant science, but that we continue to build on what we know so that we increase the widespread use and effectiveness of CBT interventions for a larger percentage of individuals who can benefit. One of the most important recent findings in our field is that CBT interventions have been found to be equally effective to psychiatric medications. But these interventions do not receive nearly enough attention, advertising, or research dollars required to enhance their effectiveness and their widespread use to reduce mental health suffering and also potentially prevent physical health difficulties as well. In fact, I would like to see medical and mental health approaches be more integrated. There is no question in my mind that CBT interventions not only influence feelings, cognitions, and behaviors, but also they impact our physical well-being. I often think that our Dean, Dr. Tom Cavalieri, here at the School of Osteopathic Medicine, really appreciates the importance of our work at CARES because osteopathic medicine emphasizes the benefits of treating the whole person, including the mind, the body, and the spirit. I truly believe in this idea, and I greatly appreciate Dr. Cavalieri's support. We see children at CARES whose circumstances and experiences leave them at high risk for both mental health and medical difficulties. But I have seen firsthand how their courage and resilience, along with effective mental health treatment, 
can dramatically reduce their risk of developing these serious problems. However, we have a long way to go before we are successful in ensuring that all children and adults have access to effective mental health services. And that is my hope for ABCT. In the years to come, I believe ABCT will continue to contribute to further advances in enhancing the accessibility of CBT services for all those individuals who can benefit. ABCT has had an extraordinarily positive impact on my career. It is the conference I go to in order to stay up to date with the latest research. It provides opportunities to connect with many of my favorite colleagues. And the presentations always leave me feeling inspired and energized. So to future young professionals, I would like to urge you to persevere in pursuing clinical psychology as a career and CBT as a valuable treatment approach for your clients. Working in the field, though incredibly fulfilling, is challenging and sometimes quite stressful. So in addition, I would encourage you all to practice what you preach, join ABCT, and attend the conferences. Stay up to date in our fast advancing field. And finally, collaborate with others. My career, more than almost anything else, has been defined by successful collaborations. Whether you're doing clinical work or training and research, I urge you to surround yourselves, as I have, with colleagues who you respect and with whom you enjoy working. It is with those colleagues that I encourage you to share the stressors associated with our challenging field, but also take time to celebrate the triumphs. And of course, don't forget to take good care of yourselves and your families, because ultimately that is what our work is all about.